Welcome to DeFi, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Jonathan Shemul, founder of Aleph.im. Good morning, Jonathan. Thanks for being with us today. Please tell us who you are and how did you get into crypto? What is your rabbit hole story? <laughs> Good morning. Um, the rabbit hole, I would say that it started when I... When I played with crypto and the and I saw that it wasn't only for payments because I have been using it for payments before like bit of Bitcoin bit of ethereum just for payments and when I got into it and really started playing uh, with like stuff like ether Delta back then mm-hmm. I saw that there was more to it and that's when I really got paid pulled in like uh, even a bit be- before ether Delta but I think that this was the tipping point and then I saw like how can I really start being into crypto doing more stuff with my life there and and then I joined the f- um, I, I started creating an open source developer community uh, for a blockchain project called nurse. Uh, which was a Chinese blockchain because they didn't have any tool like and I created a blockchain Explorer I created a lot of stuff uh, there uh, created an open source community around well they never got us any ground nor any help but it was really that's what st- sucked me in and uh, from that point how did you end up building Aleph well when I created that open source developer community um, I I ended up knowing a lot of new people around and those people became those with whom I created Aleph. Uh, Claudio, um, while I was creating that, expo- uh, that block explorer, one of the community guys told me, yeah, perhaps I can do some design for you. He became my co-founder, it's Claudio. Um, and then we were doing more and more and more tools like, like uh, Like JavaScript SDKs, um, uh, stuff with IPFS inside, like the Explorer. We were talking about doing virtual machine inside the Explorer. And that, well, it's not an Explorer anymore. Like, we are doing too many stuff. And then we say, yeah, we could also perhaps support Ethereum, blah, blah. Well, that's not an Explorer anymore. And it started being a decentralized cloud. Mm-hmm. And that's how Aleph was born. If you were at a dinner party and talking to someone who is new to crypto, how would you explain Aleph in simple terms or alternatively what, what are the steps for a completely new dev user in this case to getting started with Aleph? Well, um, if he didn't know anything about crypto, uh, basically we're doing the same on AWS, for example, like uh, like a cloud, decentralized cloud, like storage and computing. And we're doing it in a way where no one can like totally back them out of the network. If a company decides that, yeah, they, want your, uh, they like, don't want your business anymore, well, the network will just move your virtual machine and your storage to like another provider. And that's the beautiful thing of it is that no single provider can put you totally out. Obviously, if you do something really wrong that shouldn't be anywhere, no one will like want to, to like host you. But that's normal, I guess. And you could always put machine and host it yourself at worst. Mm-hmm. Is there an exact problem that you set up to solve with Aleph? Well... Our network is compatible with multiple blockchain. You can sign messages with Ethereum wallet, Solana wallet, Polkadot, Cosmos, etc. And that's where things get interesting. Like um, if you do a decentralized application, most of the time you have your backend on your own servers. Mm-hmm. And if you do stuff with multiple chain, most of the time you do it also on your own server with swaps or whatever. Well, Here you can do it on a decentralized cloud that will support multiple chains and will totally support our application and allowing to you to become fully like decentralized. And it's pretty important for DeFi applications, I think. Yeah. What makes Aleph unique compared to other cross-chain bridges, for example, the bridge or... Well, we like aren't a cross-chain bridge. Um, we like our a decentralized cloud. And what makes us um, a bit unique there is that the project isn't a blockchain. And we, and we like 
like and, and we like don't think we should be a blockchain. We are compatible with multiple of them, and you can and we can accept messages of any of those chains. And which is interesting is that, for example, compared to like Arweave, Filecoin, or like others, where you where they have their own blockchains, you need to like have bundlers are um, uh, have bridges toward their chain to like use their cloud. On ours, you don't because we don't have a blockchain and we are natively on all these chains. Okay, but you do have a consensus mechanism between all validators. Not no. really. Not really. Okay. We have staking. We have a lot of stuff, but we don't have a consensus. Ah, okay. Them. Okay. Interesting. So, apart from bridging different chains, what are, in your terms, the unique native cross-chain application that can emerge from this new frontier of interoperability? Well, um, <coughs> here with Aleph, at least. Uh, what we see, w what is interesting is that it's a decentralized database and you can sign messages from any of those chains. So, so you could do, um, let's say, a social network where users can log in with their wallets of any chain or like even wallets that aren't from a chain and are just like a secure element from your phone and would be accepted by the network. And people can just log inside, uh, log, uh, log in to like that uh, social network and then it would just work and they, they wouldn't even have to care about blockchains or anything. Uh, I see Aleph's use cases uh, range throughout document verification or creating unstoppable social networks, portable KYC, website hosting, storage for NFT metadata. What is your favorite vertical and how would you suggest to build on it? I don't know if it's my favorite, but there there is one that we have been developing a lot lately, which is indexing. We have been indexing data on Solana mostly, and we will move do, those indexers to like different chains. Basically, it's uh, we develop an open source framework where you can just make your own indexer, test it locally, and then deploy it on our network, and you don't have to like worry about RPC or anything, and you have your like indexer working. Um, and uh, and this is quite a nice vertical because it allows projects to like easily get data from on chain and decentralize their backend way more easily. So that's a nice vertical that yeah. we have. Just for the sake of clarity towards people who, who listen to our podcast, what is an indexer? What is supposed to do? Um, an indexer is like when you look at data on chain, like transactions and you look at what those transactions are actually doing. Like, for example, a user is doing a swap, a user is depositing in a pool, removing from a pool, and you infer a new state from these, uh, from, like, these actions. And, for example, when you go on Uniswap Info, for example, you can see all the transactions that, like, happen. This is an indexer. Yes. And, for example, if you go on Radium Info, on Solana, if you go on Orca information, all that data comes from Aleph. Same for, like, Solen data or stuff like that. So that would be also the DeFi use case of yeah. Aleph eventually. Okay. What is Aleph's revenue model and how does Aleph approach the gas fees for end users? So... That's a good question. <coughs> uh, Aleph is not a blockchain, so we don't have gas fees. Okay. So that's a bit different than like others. Um, we have a token, which is the Aleph token. And to do things on Aleph, you need the Aleph tokens. Right. Except for some things, you, there, there, there are some actions where you don't need tokens, but that's another story. But for most of them, you will need Aleph tokens. Uh, you need to like just hold Aleph tokens in a wallet to do actions currently. That's what we call the holder tier, which is the one which is live right now, which allows us to like bootstrap the network. You just need to hold Aleph tokens and you get service. You can store files, store database entries. You can have virtual machine running on the network, etc. Just holding Aleph tokens. But with different tiers. So according to the um, to the balance you have, you, exactly. you unlock different tiers. Exactly. Okay, interesting. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, we have a set of nodes. We have the core channel node, which are the controllers of the network. And we also have the, uh, the resource node, which are actually providing the resource. Currently, they, they are paid by, by what we call the minimum wage, which, which means that they will get paid no matter what. And this is what pays for this holder tier. What we will have next year is the pay-as-you-go, where you consume Alef tokens and you pay Alef tokens continuously to get service. Credits on, a, on an arcade game, basically. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Exactly. That's actually good. 
Yeah. Um, if you had to evaluate potential risks and vulnerabilities in Aleph that could be inner or external or coming from misuse of the protocol from users, what would they be? Um, I would mostly see currently deny, uh, denial of service. That's something that we know exactly which vulnerability we might have. We know how to fix them. It's just a matter of putting the work for to like do it. But if it ever happens, we, will acti- we have some stuff that we can activate to medicate it. And this, that's the main things that we see as vulnerabilities, probably. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this multi-chain interoperability uh, allows Aleph to be a potential adoption product for, say, governments and institutions? Yeah, I think so, because uh, government and institution need to like have actual cloud that can talk to blockchains in the future, especially if they want to talk to multiple blockchains, yeah. because the world of blockchain is fragmented, and if one country chooses one, another chooses other... Standards are gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so having a cloud that supports both will be critical for them. So yeah, I clearly think that we can help on that area. Still staying on the institutional side, what have been some of your challenges, for example, regulations? And uh, if there's anything, what is holding, in your terms, Aleph back? Or what, what would you like to see working better? Well, um, the Aleph token is a utility token and we need to be really careful because it serves for the utility on the network. We need to be really careful designing it so that it stay, always stays a pure utility token. So that's one of the challenges which derives from certain regulation on what is a security and what is a utility token. And this is something that we always need to keep in mind because in our mind, it's a utility token. Like It's used to like pay for storage and computing. That's its use case. And that's where it's, it's hard. And there are things that we can't do because it would be, it would be problematic. So, yeah. Being a utility token and being transferable doesn't allow users to independently pull it and uh, kind of making it... Uh, de facto a security. Well, what if users do whatever they want with it, that's yeah. not really our concern. Okay. They want to like use it in DeFi, they can. Yeah. Because it's a token. Like we like even have our token listed on some kind of yield pool and stuff like that. But I mean, that's not really our concern. Okay. We are building a, like a utility market with, with with a utility token, so That's the main use case of the token. All the rest is secondary. Yes. The second question was, what is holding, in your terms, Aleph back right now, if there's anything that you would see, you would like to see working better in the future? Well, we like had some, some concern voiced by some potential partners. Um, like, let's say there is, a big cl- there, there is a big cloud provider that wants to start providing services on Aleph. I mean, in the future, that could totally happen. We could see Google Cloud, AWS, uh, Ali Cloud, or whoever start putting servers on the network. And that would be okay, as long as they aren't the most used one or whatever. Yeah. Uh, be- because people c- could l- could like just move, a- move away from us, choose, uh, choose not us, but someone else. And like if they pull the trigger on someone, it would automatically move elsewhere. So that wouldn't be an issue, and it- that might uh, even help on the prices, etc. But for them, and like other institutions, uh, bigger players, what they need is a direct um, fiat gateway, like being able to like get paid directly in dollar or paid directly in dollar. Yep. And there is no really simple use case for that right now in DeFi. And we would love to like being able to like just use DeFi tools and allow that, for example. Mm-hmm. What are your forecasts in terms of relationships between governments and, and the DeFi ecosystem? Do you, do you think that we will see more of um, Alex uh, Pertsev uh, Tornado Cash cases? And uh, what's, your, what's your take on, on what is happening? <coughs> That's a good question. I think that there is some kind of... Uh, what has been known by the open source industry for a while, which is called Embrace and Extend, then Kill 
which has been used a lot by Microsoft, for example, against open source. Like they come, they provide tools, everyone likes it, and then they 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 like start adding features that don't work with the rest slowly, and then people are just trapped inside their inside like their ecosystem. Right. And like you can't use anything else. It happened with Internet Explorer, for example. Like they started adding features, and then all the website only worked with Internet Explorer. Uh, well. The main issue with Embrace and Extend is that uh, governments might start doing that with like providers that are adding new features, uh, 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 adding fiat gateways, etc. So it starts working. We're like, yeah, that's great. We have really good gateways with like the threat fee um, world. That's cool. But then they start adding uh, wh what you just said, like like sanctions. Like yeah. This tool is not compatible with us. This tool is not compatible with us. If you want to to like to like use us, you can do do that, and then that's the road to kill the the world DeFi world, and that's what we need to fight against if we really like DeFi. Do you see symptoms of that already happening, like uh, yeah, everywhere? Scale? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the case that like you just mentioned is one of these symptoms. Yeah. Last question, do you have any highlights to anticipate about the future of Aleph? Well, um, we have a big partnership currently with Ubisoft, uh, um, which is one of our biggest partners, uh, and we really like them. And I would really love them having more, n more nodes of our network. That could be nice. Uh, maybe it will happen. Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's one big thing. And we might support more chains and have more projects in the near future, more partnership with other ecosystem players that we would love to work to, etc. Okay. Jonathan, thank you very much for being with thank us you. today. Thank you very much.